Good morning. Good to see you all here again on this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. Uh, we want to welcome all of you out there in internet land on Facebook and YouTube to our services this morning. And again, we would have, invite you to come and join us in person for our live services here at the New Troy Grace Brethren Church every Sunday at 11 a.m. And uh, we also have our Sunday school hour at 10, 10 a.m. However, we have indefinitely suspended our evening services until further notice uh, because of certain circumstances. That's all I want to say about that right now. All right. It's always good to uh, see familiar faces out there and uh, we're always happy to have visitors. And I do want to make a special announcement concerning next Sunday. Next Sunday will be a very special Sunday because my brother Eddie, Dr. Edward Mensinger, will be here to um, share God's word with us from the pulpit. He and his wife Linda are going to be here. My brother Wayne, Reverend Wayne Mensinger, is also going to be here. And uh, my sister, her husband, and several relatives I know have said they would be here, so it's going to be a very special Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. And again, any of you who remember Eddie, uh, he attended Nutra High School here, same as I did. And um, he comes back uh, usually around once a year. And I had him preach last year, and we had a really good turnout, so I decided I'd let him preach again this year. And uh, the relatives always like to hear Eddie preach, and so do I. So anyway, that's a reminder about that. This week, on Tuesday, will be at 7 o'clock, will be our semi-annual business meeting. Very, very important business that we have to discuss. And uh, several who have to have reports ready to be turned in to give reports at that meeting. So uh, heads up uh, for all of you who are concerned with that. And I've already mentioned next Sunday. Also, I forgot to mention, following the morning service, we will have a carry and dinner fellowship time downstairs in the basement at church parlors, and you're all invited to stay for that. It will be a potluck meal, and we'll have a time of uh, refreshment and fellowship with Eddie and Linda and uh, the others who are going to be here. And then following that, we will probably, I would guess, go out to our house uh, just about a half mile um, east of New Troy there on Glendora Road and spend the rest of the afternoon out there. Okay, enough about that. Continue to remember those on our prayer request list. Uh, <clears throat> Carol Stuckey is now home and she's doing quite well. Um, her niece has been with her who is a registered nurse and I talked to her last Sunday and she said Carol was doing well, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, America Schmaltz is still in the South Haven Rehab Center in room 204. For anyone who might want to go up there and see her. Uh, John White is still home under hospice care. Continue to remember him and his wife Mitzi in your prayers. And also their, uh, her mother, um, Kay Panico. Kay's been having some issues with uh, her feet and uh, some other uh, health issues, and so really keep her in your prayers. Uh, she's having infusions, I guess, every day. For She's got a couple more weeks to go on that, and uh, I know her, she was a little bit down in her spirits and looked, looked pretty rough the last couple of weeks, so please uh, beseech the throne of grace for Sister Peyton. Kay Panico. Also continue to remember Joyce and Curtis Smith, Sherry and Brent Galaro, Brother Joe DeRossi. And then our pastors that we have on our list, Brother Pastor Dick Harstein, Jeff Eno, Chris Knight, Mike Ostrander, Howard Bennett, and also uh, Pastor Jim Rosa's wife, Patty. Continue to keep them all in your prayers. All right, if you're reading through the Bible, you should be at Proverbs 26. If you're going through the New Testament, you should be the third time through, you should be at Luke 
seven. All right, I think that's all the announcements I need to highlight at this time. So before we get into the word this morning, let's have an opening word of prayer, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this beautiful Lord's Day. Truly, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We just pray a special blessing upon each one who's here this morning and those who are tuned in from internet land. Lord, I just pray your richest blessings upon each one. I just pray especially this morning that your Holy Spirit would be in our presence, that you would anoint my lips, anoint our ears and hearts, and uh, as the, hide me behind the cross, Lord, as the message goes forth, that it would go forth in the power and might of your Holy Spirit, we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. Before I get into the message this morning, and the title of my message today is uh, The Assurance of Sharing Christ's Glory. And my text is from 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Before I get into my message, though, I would like to share this short little message, or this story with you. And uh, I thought it was kind of good. Um, this lady named Barbara C., uh, re remains in the hospital and needs blood donors for more transfusions. She's had trouble sleeping and has requested tapes of Pastor Bill's sermons. Had a couple ways to take that, isn't there? Evidently, Pastor Bill is either a very boring speaker and will put her to sleep or she just wants to listen to his messages. We hope it's the latter. All right, please turn with me this morning in your Bibles, your swords, to 1 John 3. We're looking at two verses, 2 and 3. And please follow along as I read from the New American Standard Bible. John writes this, starting with verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears... We will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. All right, now we'll get into the body of my message. As John begins uh, this section, he uh, relates to us that the best remedy for all ills and difficulties for believers experiencing adversity and suffering is to center attention on the joy of better days ahead. You know, Paul used this principle, he applied this principle in his letter to the Romans in which he wrote, and this is from Romans 8:18. He said, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And Paul went through a lot of suffering. But he, uh, he said, this is nothing. It, it, it's, it's, not the, it's not that big a deal. You know, I had a hearty amen to that. And by way of illustration, I thought the best, one of the best ways to illustrate is, is the illustration of a woman who's expecting, who's expecting to have a child. And I remember this when my children were born. You know, the, Amer the expectant mother is fortified, at least to a degree, against the pain of childbirth by her anticipation of the joys of motherhood. I remember years ago, a woman saying, child, child, pain in childbirth is a pain that you can forget. And God has equipped women with a special um, ability to do that. I can't, I don't forget pain. I went through horrific pain when I had a uh, burst appendix and uh, some other things in my life. And as a rule, men cannot take pain. That's why women have children, not men. 
In like fashion, the student is encouraged to endure the quote unquote pangs of studying by anticipating the benefits of future employment or a career. You know, you study hard to get that degree with the hope that you will have uh, uh, employment or a career after that. And Jesus supremely de demonstrated this attitude in his redemptive suffering. In the epistle of the Hebrews, he is described as, and this is from Hebrews 12 to the author there, who I personally believe was Paul, but the author of the Hebrews says that he, that is Christ, is the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus was able to endure all this because he saw the goal that lay ahead. You know, John adopts this principle in his assurance for the children of God. In other words, he, he emphasizes here that anticipation of the future provides motivation for the present. First of all, let's look at the assurance of being the children of God. In verse 2, John says, again, Beloved, now we are the children of God. And in effect, this is a, a re repetition of the statement in verse 1, where he said that we would be called children of God. He's emphasizing this by re repeating this again. Remember, we are his children now, not sometime, now, right now. One never becomes more a member of a family, a child of his parents, than he is at birth. So it is with the child of God. Family likeness becomes more pronounced, but the identity remains the same throughout the life of the person. Here is encouragement for the seeker after evidence that eternal life is a present possession of all who have been born again. When I, when I studied this, a verse that immediately popped into my head was Ephesians 1.3, where Paul wrote there to the Ephesian believers, he said, Blessed by the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. When Paul wrote this, he still was on earth. He wasn't in heaven, but he was saying, I have the assurance that one day I will dwell in the heavenly places with Christ. And as far as he was concerned, he had already been given those blessings, that assurance of eternal life. And that's exactly what John's saying also. Secondly, the assurance of being the children like him we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him. We will see him just as he is. As our minds dwell on this assurance, we find it impossible to frame words suitable for such a momentous announcement, such a glorious experience. We shall be like him. However, in our present mode of existence, the likeness is imperfect. You know, we shall be like him, but right now our likeness to him is imperfect. First of all, the likeness is obscured. He says, it has not yet appeared as to what we will be. The future likeness of John's dear children to Christ is for the present a mystery. And again, the Apostle Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, he says, Things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. You know, we can glean a lot of things up from the scriptures that give us a pretty good snapshot, a pretty good view of what lies in store for the believer, but certainly not all of it. Surely included in this is a statement about our future with Christ. 
We have been told about it, but human language falls far short of adequately describing our future. For the present then, we have, quote, a hope not seen, but nonetheless assured. You know, when I think about this thing with, with the language and describing, I think of the Apostle John who described the eternal city there in the Revelation. And he described it, oh, oh, in magnificence. But you know, I've always said, when we get to heaven, I don't think anybody's going to arrive at the pearly gates and look there and say, yep, just like I figured. You know, what John portrayed there was the best he could do in human language that we could understand. What he saw was something so far greater, he couldn't describe it any other way. And I think when we get to heaven and see it, its glories and all that God has done prepared for us in that eternal city, we're just going to be blown away. Absolutely. You know, the late Dr. Harry Ironside <clears throat> told a story of an artist who wanted to produce a masterpiece as his final painting. So he arranged his large canvas across one side of his studio, put up the scaffolding, brought in his big, thick brushes, and prepared to paint. It looked more like a job of house painting because of the size and, and the grandeur of it. First, he prepared the background, putting a daub of gray here, a daub of gray there, and some black elsewhere. Occasionally, he descended from his scaffolding to look at his work. He moved back then walked across the studio from side to side, examining it. It kind of reminds me of Charlton Heston in that movie where he portrayed the, the great artist Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. And a visitor came to his studio to see how the artist was progressing. And he, the artist was walking around and of course he, he just assumed he was there alone. And he bumped into this uh, visitor as he moved about. And turning around to see who had come, come in, he said, why are you here? I didn't hear you come in. What do you think of the picture? That is going to be my masterpiece. Isn't it magnificent? His friend replied, well, I don't see anything there but a lot of daubs of paint. Oh, I forgot, said the painter. You see only what is already on the canvas. I see the finished picture, the finished product. So it is with our Lord, the master artist. He sees the finished product, but we only see the unfinished creation. I think it was Pastor Art who used to say, we all ought to wear a sign on us that says, God is not through with me yet. And that's the truth. We are an unfinished product. But when we are raptured or translated into heaven or rise from the grave at, at the, his second coming, then we will be the finished product. Secondly, the likeness is modeled. First we looked at the likeness was obscured, now we're going to look at the likeness as modeled. The quote, when he appears, Jesus Christ is the perfect model of what we shall be. The risen Lord appeared at numerous times and places, but many of his glories remain veiled. Christ revealed much of his glory to his, to his disciples during his post-resurrection appearances, but not all, not nearly all. From these appearances, we learn that natural laws have no effect on such a body, the glorified body that our Lord had. From these appearances, we become aware that the glorified body is composed, composed of flesh and bones, as Luke writes in 2439, not flesh and blood, flesh and bones. From them we know that the risen Christ is free from corruption and moral mortality. Excuse me. Mortality. Knowing these details, we await his appearing again for further revelation. He is our model. 
Thirdly, the likeness is anticipated. We will be like him. Jesus, who is our perfect model, will appear and present himself as the ideal of what we will be by his grace and power that we will become. We will be like him. It's hard to wrap your head around that, isn't it? Until he comes, however, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And when we see him face to face, that look will transform us into his likeness. You know, the hymn writer, Carrie E. Breck, wrote a very, very beautiful and well-known hymn called Face to Face. I'd like to share a little bit of that with you. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture. I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face we shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky, face to face in all his glory. I shall see him by and by. Tremendous words in that hymn. You know, three details of special interest may be stimulating to the inquisitive mind at this point. God created man in his own image, according to Genesis 1, 26, 27. He said, let us make man in our image. That current image, however, was badly marred by sin. And therefore, then the Son of God had to clothe himself with human form to qualify for his redemptive ministry, which, of course, was dying on Calvary's cross. He took on man's likeness or image and through his faithfulness to his father's will, which the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 10, 7 says, where he says, thy will, O God, I, I came to do my father's will and, that's, and he did. He made it possible for man to stand again in the likeness of God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. That's the whole thrust of the book of Hebrews. It's about Jesus Christ. The cycle will be complete at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And at that instant, born again believers will be perfect in their condition as they are now in their position. This is our great expectation. You know, the late G.G. Finley, who was a great uh, preacher, scholar, a Bible commentator, and he wrote a, a, a tremendous work on the commentary of Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. And he was professor of biblical languages for the training school for Methodist ministers. He wrote this, he says, quote, as the son of God humbled himself to share our estate. So he in turn will glorify men that they may take their part in his. Tremendous words there from the late G.G. Finley. Thirdly, the assurance of becoming like him. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. What John in verse 2 assures us will occur in an instant of eternity being completely like Christ. In fact, becoming true in our present life According to verse 3, you can read it for yourself, verse 3. The next point is the stability of this hope. He says, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him, and this hope points back to verse 2. The coming of our blessed Lord from heaven and our becoming like him when we see him. The original text of verse 3 is significant. And a literal translation should read, and every man that hath this hope set on him. It is a fixed hope, a stable hope, not an erratic, periodic one. The idea here, according to Dr. Kenneth Wiest, is that of hope resting upon him or hope set on him, 
based on the preposition in the original text, which means upon. Next is the progress of this hope. Verse 3, he purifies himself. And a preferred reading in this clause would be, is purifying himself. Since the verb is in the present active indicative tense, indicating progressive or continuing action. I took Greek about 20 years ago from Dr. Kevin Zuber, and that was one of the things that he really hammered away and wanted us to get through our heads was the present active indicative. And in your older translations, you don't see that. But in the newer translations, it shows that it is a past act that is now, it is continuing, that is going on. A very good example is where it says, for the preaching of the cross is to them who are perishing foolishness. In the old translation, it just says, the preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness. It doesn't carry over that idea of a continuing action, and that's what this is here. You know, there's a certain transmission on the mind and emotions about looking forward to becoming like Christ because it stimulates us to strive for his likeness now. And there is no incentive to holy living like the hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, in that uh, hymn, Face to Face, um, that is just highlighted throughout that hymn very vividly. There is therefore no more practical truth in Holy Scripture leading to Christ-like behavior than the anticipation of momentarily standing face to face with the one who went all the way into the agony of hell so that we need not to go. When he died on Calvary's cross, he, uh, he, went, he was uh, subjected to the unmitigated wrath of God and that was the agony of hell, believe you me. And he did it so we wouldn't have to. It purifies, it really does. Lastly is the goal of this hope, just as he is pure. You know, the apostle to the Gentiles, who was Paul, of course, writing to the Corinthian church said about this goal, and this is in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. You know, Paul's transformed into the same glory or same image from glory to glory is equivalent to John's where he says purifies himself just as he is pure. And the more we are occupied with Christ, the less we are occupied with the things of this world and, and of course, less occupied with ourselves. Then our assurance of eternal life rings with clarity and clearness in our hearts. We know it is a principle of human behavior that we tend to become like that upon which we center our attention. Yes, that's just the way it is. If it is fixed upon the world with all of its wickedness, we become like the world. If it is upon Jesus Christ, we become more and more like him, even as he is pure. You know, our late pastor, very close friend of mine, Pastor Art McCrum, used to say, you know, we have two natures if we are truly born again. We have, still have that old nature, but we also have the new nature. And he said, whichever one we feed, that's the one that's going to show itself or be the dominant one in our lives. And like I said here, if we, if we focus upon the world and the things of the world, that old nature is gonna take over. But if we shut those things out as much as we can, concentrate on reading God's word, communing with the Holy Spirit in prayer, 
feed that new nature, then the, the new nature will become dominant. And that is what Christ wants us to strive to be. All right. In two weeks, Lord willing, we will continue in our study and look at the practice of sin is prevented by the law of God. We're going to look at just one verse, 1 John 3, 4. Again, a reminder, I will not be, uh, be sharing next week online because my brother Eddie will be here next Sunday to preach. And uh, so in two weeks, um, we will have another message that we will put online for all of you to, to listen to and hopefully enjoy and to learn from. All right, that's it for this week. So this is Pastor Bob Mintzinger then saying goodbye for this week. And again, we hope to see you then in two weeks, uh, same time, same station. In the meantime, keep looking up, keep encouraging and exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. All right, God bless you. Goodbye for now. And we hope to see you then in two weeks. Amen. God bless you.